Well, in addition to taking out a major terrorist leader in the world, President Trump's uh, ordering a drone strike on Qasem Soleimani in Iraq, the Iranian Quds Force leader, has sparked a discussion in this country as well as around the world. And I'd like to just kind of carry on that discussion here with my colleagues Stephen Green and Bill Whittle, and I'm Scott Ott, and this show is made possible by the members at BillWhittle.com. Uh, gentlemen, there have been, um, a, there's a, a lot of concern following this, what some are calling an assassination on this Quds Force leader, this guy who has American blood on his hands, whose organization is responsible directly and indirectly for the deaths of hundreds, perhaps thousands of Americans, um, who you know essentially has ordered uh, the IEDs uh, to be placed in where our troops are get, were getting maimed and killed in Iraq. Um, and yet, a lot of people are, are concerned. And number one, um, and, and Steve, I just want to pose this question to you, uh, because there are a couple of aspects of kind of how conservatives especially approach uh, war in a constitutional context uh, that may raise some concerns. And, and really, the audience for this show is not our typical uh, folks who um, it would immediately jump to the defense of what the president would do. I'm hoping that this show becomes something that they can share with their friends who are maybe not completely in that camp yet. Um, so two aspects of this. Number one, the idea of assassinating leaders of another country. And number two, um, how far down the road can this go before a constitutional president goes to Congress for a declaration of war? Uh, well, there's a, a lot to unpack there. I'll, I'll see what I can, uh, I, I can do with this in a, a fairly brief amount of time. Uh, let's not forget this this assassination. I think we can fairly call it that. I think that's a, a word that could be good or bad, depending on who the target is. Uh, this assassination did not occur in a vacuum. Far from it. Uh, you listed the fact that uh, uh, Soleimani was head of Iran's terrorist force, Al-Quds. That was their job, killing civilians, spreading terror and all the rest. Um, he was in Baghdad, in Iraq, not in Iran, he was in Baghdad doing a victory lap for the attack on our embassy that he orchestrated, the attack on our our Iraqi embassy that he orchestrated. Which uh, is sovereign U.S. territory. Exactly. That is an act of war. It is absolutely, by every understood definition of sovereign territory and embassy, that was an act of war that he committed against the United States. And of course, it's not the first time either. We remember what happened in 1979 when Iranians stormed the U.S. embassy in Tehran and took 52 hostages and held them for 444 days. Now, was Reagan wrong to uh, threaten action against Iran when he was running for president? Well, I don't think so, because 52 Americans were put on board flights direct uh, uh, for, uh, for US, uh, a U.S. Air Force base in Germany uh, while Reagan was being sworn in as president. They didn't want to face this guy. Well, the Iranians since then uh, have had one weak president after another, not necessarily weak presidents, but presidents who uh, were kind of mystified as to what to do about this state sponsor of terror. Well, Trump ran on getting us out of endless wars. He still hasn't figured out how to get us out of Afghanistan. And I, I honestly, I just kind of wish he'd cut bait on that. It's, it's, it's over and it has been for a long time. But you can't just leave the Middle East in, in shambles. You've got to get out with something resembling something better than it is right now. And the best way to do that is to get the Iranians to stop doing what they're doing. They've been waging this shadow war, as Richard Fernandez called it, and uh, a brilliant column he wrote for PJ Media a couple of days ago. He's uh, to bring this war out of the shadows, to force Iran to either do this stuff much more publicly or to stop doing this stuff. And when I say stuff, I mean terrorism, I mean murder and all the rest. I mean waging war against the United States and our friends and our allies to stop doing this stuff. By assassinating, killing, targeting, whatever you want to call it, Soleimani in such a flagrantly public way, Trump has set the stage for peace. It may be a highly unlikely peace, but before Friday, peace was impossible. Trump has taken it from impossible to unlikely. I'll take that. It's a step up. It's an improvement. Bill Whittle, it seems like there's uh, the complaint of, about President Trump often in 
practically every realm in which he operates as the chief executive and the commander in chief is that he's not a strategic thinker. Um, if anything, he's a tactical thinker, but some people even cast, da cast doubt on that by basically saying, well, I'm not sure that he really has any tactic other than do the unexpected. Uh, do the thing that nobody was thinking you would do. And, uh, you know, if you get an opportunity to punch your opponent in the nose before they can punch you, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, the, uh, the, the critique in this particular situation is that if you don't have a strategic plan and you go and you hit somebody like that, if you take out Soleimani um, and with no apparent pathway after that, no apparent strategy of what you're going to do in the wake of that, and then just sit back and wait for the Iranian retribution, um, aren't you not only putting at risk uh, the lives of people that Iran may go after, whether those are diplomats or allies, um, but you know, you're know, you essentially sowing chaos in an area of the world that needs uh stability. Bill, I, I know this is not an attack on President Trump that I'm suggesting here. I think that that's the kind of thing that, that reasonable people would wrestle with and say, how does this play out? Well, there's two different ways we can look at this. We can look at, at the Iranian regime as a sovereign nation, or we can look at them as a terrorist organization. So let's take them one by one. Yeah. If we want to assume that they're a terrorist organization because they kill American troops in Iraq without wearing uniforms, without a declaration of war, they've been at war with us since 1979. They overran an embassy in 1979 in Tehran. That is universally recognized, as Steve, as Steve pointed out, along with things like putting a blockade around a country, that is an act of war. They did it again just a couple uh, days ago, and then this was a response to that. So if we want to look at them as a terrorist organization, then this strike on this guy doesn't strike me as anything different than the strikes on bin Laden, the strikes on on any one of these uh, people who, we've, who we have, over the course of the last uh, 20 years now almost, yeah. found the location of, sure of the location, and then launched airstrikes against people like this. We've been doing this since the beginning of time. If you don't like this strike against um, against Soleimani, then you're really not in much of a position to say that you're in favor of the strike against bin Laden. Because Soleimani has American blood on his hands for his actions in the past, and he is continuing plans to kill American soldiers. And when people say, well, what's Donald Trump's motivation? Seems to me that his motivation is he has a chance to take out a guy who has skill in killing Americans. And I, and I think that is a preventative, proactive defense of U.S. troops and interests abroad. And I think from a terrorist point of view, if you want to look at terror, Iran as a sponsor of terrorism, this guy is the top terrorist. And he was de dealt with as, as anybody else would who's a terrorist. Now, if you want to look at this as, as a nation state, and by the way, I might point out that this is where I, Iran is, is trying to have it both ways. And this is their strategy is to have it both ways. They want to act like a nation, but they don't want to, but they don't want to go. They didn't go into Iraq and fight American soldiers with Iranian tanks and Iranian soldiers wearing Iranian uniforms because we would have kicked their butts. So what they did was they infiltrated, they infiltrate when they had they have Hamas and Hezbollah and all these other things. They use terrorist tactics to achieve national aims. And so for us to get a little prissy about, well, was this a terrorist? Or sp this is what Iran's strategy is. We're a nation that uses terrorism, terrorism to advance our national agenda. It's this hybrid. And so it has to be treated as a hybrid. Now, if you want to look at it from the national point of view, then you have to ask yourself, how is this attack any different than the one that the United States launched in, um, in the middle of World War II when they had word that the, that the, that the architectural genius on the enemy side in, um, in World War II in Japan, uh, Yamamoto, the, the, the admiral who orchestrated not only the attack on Pearl Harbor, but the first six months of the war where Japan just didn't take any losses whatsoever. We intercepted a radio situation. In other words, we had actionable intelligence that for a very brief period of time, we knew where Yamamoto was going to be. That, just the fact that we knew for sure where he was going to be was, was the actual breakthrough. And when we knew where we, 
when we knew he was going to be in a certain place at a certain time, then we started asking questions like, can we get there? Can we get there in order to stop this guy? Can we kill him if we can get there? Turns out in, in, in that particular mission, the P-38 Lightning with drop tanks had just enough range to fly for hours and hours and hours, spend six or seven minutes at the destination. That's all they had fuel for and come back. Turns out that uh, Yamamoto yeah, was a pretty punctual guy. And we took out the, the architect of, of Pearl Harbor. But here's what's interesting about that. Before that raid was launched, when we knew that we could get him, when we knew we had at least a chance to get him, the question that was asked of Nimitz repeatedly was, if we kill Yamamoto, will there be somebody better taking over his place? Will we? Re will he be replaced with somebody more capable? And every single answer was no. There's no, no, he is the genius. He's the mastermind. Everybody else in the command structure, has, not, none of them have anything like this guy's strategic and tactical sense. Okay, so in order to win the war, that's what we did. Nobody cried about that. Yamamoto was wearing a uniform. And this guy is wearing a uniform too. So either, either it's a response to a guy who's killed people through terrorism, or it is an attack on an enemy nation that has been attacking and killing Americans since 1979. In either the national case or the terrorist case, these actions are not only justified, they're required. They're required. They're required morally, and more importantly, they're required as a deterrent effect. And this is the last point I'll make for people who maybe not understanding this entire hawk point of view. We can turn this into something that you can uh, that you can understand directly because you've had personal experience with this. I'd be willing to bet that just about anybody who's worried about being sent over to um, uh, Iran to uh, fight in, in a war and, and get drafted and die and, and are concerned about World War III and their personal safety, I'd be willing to bet you that the huge majority of those people tend to be uh, extremely peaceful people. They're, they're not violent people. They, they wouldn't hurt a fly. Uh, if we end up in a shooting war with Iran, I would just parenthetically point out that the Iranians are not likely to ever see an American, let alone ever have a chance to shoot at one. But uh, put that aside for a second. We have gone to a volunteer armed service because we learned in Vietnam that it is worse to have troops in our own barracks who want to kill us than it is to have a smaller force facing an enemy force. This is so deeply ingrained in the military now of all the lessons we learned in Vietnam, this was the one. Better to have a small group of dedicated professionals who want to be there than a large group of people who are there against their will and sowing discord and, and lowering morale and so on. No one's going to get drafted in this war. And we're not going to need any additional troops because we're not going to expose any troops. It's not necessary. Unlike other terrorist organizations, Iran has the advantage of being a terrorist organization and a nation, but they also carry the disadvantage that that entails. And that means there are places in Iran that we can bomb and we can hit military installations and make them pay a military price. Hit people in uniform. That's what wars are. Hey, uh, but but, to, oh, but just to connect, hang on, just, just want to finish this point. Just to connect this to those of you out there who may be worried about being sent to Iran or in a war and why people like me say that killing this guy was a, a very good thing because not because it brings war, but because it maintains peace. Here's something that you can all connect to. If you're a kind person, a decent person, and, you, and you've never hurt a person in your life, and you can't imagine hurting a person in your life, then you're like most people in the world, or most people in America anyway. And chances are that if you ever experienced bullying as a child growing up, you were one of those people who were not a bully. It's almost impossible for people who, who were bullies to be traumatized by, by this kind of idea. Those people like to fight. So you have to ask yourself, what is the best strategy for dealing with bullies? What is consistently said again and again and again? What is the advice given to people like you and me, the people watching this, Steve and Scott and all of us, if we end up in a, in a jail overnight or in a federal uh, prison, what is the advice that comes from people who have spent decades in those environments? What do they tell you to do? They say if the, the second, not if, when somebody comes over and starts to try to steal your cornbread or whatever the case may be, you have to 
immediately fly across the room and start fighting with that person because the person who is instigating this is not looking for cornbread and they're not looking for money. They are looking for weakness. That's what they want to know. And if you've ever dealt with bullies, you know that the idea of saying to a bully, no, here, take my lunch money. In fact, if you want to talk about some of your problems with your drunk dad, I'd be happy to sit and check. There's not, not going to be anything left of you. What, what we find again and again and again, and this is really important, folks, so hang on to this. You don't have to beat up the bully. They're not looking for you to beat them. They're just looking to see if you're ready to fight back. They're looking to see if you are, are willing to defend yourself. And I have a, a theory about this. And, and I, I really do believe this. If you have, uh, if you have a, 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 a foal, a baby horse that's born with defective legs, a birth defect, let's say, all of the other mares, all of the other female horses will try to help that horse to its feet and try and steady it and so on. But the second a stallion sees it, he will stomp it to death. The stallion stomps it to death because evolution has dictated to that stallion, put into its programming, that horses with leg defects will pass on leg defects to other horses, and that means we are gone, so they, so they eliminate the weak. It's a biological imperative. Almost every mammal species has a built-in biological imperative to, to destroy the, the, the weak, the maimed, the deformed, and so on. Almost all of them. Now, because we're civilized people, we don't have to do that. Our entire purpose of if life as conservatives is to make sure that the weak and the defenseless are defended. This is the entire reason of being humans. We don't have to be submitted to this. But I maintain that bullying is a vestige of that evolutionary requirement. I maintain that there are some people who are compelled for reasons that they don't understand to hit and push people that they perceive to be weak, who have a built-in loathing and hatred of weakness. And this is why when you finally decide to fight back against a bully, you don't have to beat them up. All you have to do is be willing to stand for yourself. And that immediately deactivates that inside that bully's mind and says, this is not a person who I need to worry about. It's not a weak person. They're, they're they're capable of, of and, and it just turns it off. I really believe this. But in any event, there are societies that are bullies and other societies that are cooperative. And we're a cooperative society. And we didn't take over their embassy. And we didn't take over their embassy just a couple of weeks ago. We didn't do any of this. We've had it done to us. And we have continued on and on and on. And people have been pushing us and knocking us around. And people have been thumping us on the back of the head and giving us nuggies and wedgies and all the rest of it. And we've been minding our own business, hoping that these people would go away. And I think finally, we've realized that we have a president who understands the dynamic of bullying, the dynamic of intimidation, the dynamic of deception and fraud and all of this stuff, and has understood that we don't have to knock them out. We just have to turn around and hit them back. And that will be when they realize that the days of a free lunch money are over. And that is what I am utterly convinced is the case. And if you don't believe me, Take a look at what happened in World War II. The command staff of the generals of Adolf Hitler's upper level command, OKW, Oberkommando de Wehrmacht, the generals that were underneath Adolf Hitler said after the war that when Hitler went into the Rhineland, there was a part of Germany that was demilitarized. It was part of the, the loss of them in World War I. The Treaty of Versailles said that Germany cannot put any troops into this area that buffered France. Well, Hitler decided that, that the West wasn't going to respond. He was a bully and he thought that the people he was bullying weren't going to fight back. So he put a small group of armed troops into this demilitarized zone. And when the West did nothing, he realized that he was up against people who were never going to fight him back. He could take their lunch money, do whatever they want to. But the generals, the generals said after the war, those that survived said that if Adolf, they said if the French had put a battalion, if they put a group of soldiers, if they put a marching band, very likely if the French, and I'm not making this up, this is this is a proven yeah. fact. They said very likely if the French had put one constable, one policeman in the middle of that bridge with the baton saying, you are not allowed to cross this bridge. This area is, is demilitarized. And you're going to have to go over me if you're going to do it. You're going to have to kill me. That would have caused Hitler to turn around and then the generals would have taken him out back and shot him. And World War II never would have happened. It, it came down to something that simple. Are you willing to stand up and say, I've had enough of it? No, 
you're not going any further, or are we going to backtrack and backtrack and backtrack and backtrack and backtrack to the point where these people think that we are so weak that we won't fight, forget about fighting in a bridge in, in the Rhineland. We're not going to fight for a bridge in Cleveland. That's when you get into trouble. Yeah. And Donald Trump has basically said, no, the days of you hitting us and getting away with it scot-free are finished. Now there's going to be a price for every time you hurt us. And if you want to take a look at who can do the most hurting, you're going to find out that this advantage is no longer yours. You have a big advantage when you can be the only people that are doing the hitting. But when a guy who's much, 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 much bigger than you are decides he's going to hit back, now the calculation has to change. Uh, Steve Green, did Scott, you have something to add? Yeah, just just two very quick things. Uh, the the first is you you phrase Bill's question. What about Iranian retaliation? Well, how would we tell the difference between retaliation for the assassination of Soleimani and the plans that Soleimani already had in action in the planning stage to to kill and murder more Americans? You, you couldn't tell the difference at all. It's the exact same stuff. The difference after the Soleimani killing is this. Maybe his successor will look at that famous photograph of the orange fireball where his predecessor had, had, had sat in a car the moment before and decide that maybe his self-interest doesn't lie in murdering more Americans. Well, I've had a chance to have uh, some conversations and questions with people who, uh, in the wake of the drone strike on uh, Qasem Soleimani, were wondering where this is going. Um, in general, there are a lot of people in this country uh, who are already concerned about uh, President Trump and the way he behaves. He certainly is not uh, a kind of guy who uh, seems to follow protocol or decorum. He is not acting presidential as we have come to know it. Uh, he is his own man. He is a, somewhat of a force of nature. He's continued to act in the White House the way he did when he was a New York City developer and a publicity machine. Um, and so I, I, I'm not going to try to convince you if you already think that President Trump is either unhinged or uh, uh, has bad motives. I'm not gonna try to convince you necessarily uh, that I can immediately jump in as soon as this event happens and say, yes, he did the right thing and he did it for the right reasons. All I wanna do is open up the possibility in your mind that there is a rational and reasonable explanation for doing something like this. And so that I'm not asking for too big of a piece of pie here. I just want a little slice of your time and your mind to consider the possibility. First of all, uh, while the media portrays this as a strike ordered by President Trump, anybody who has followed anything, in fact, you don't even have to follow politics or know anything about the Pentagon. You can watch movies and you know that these kind of decisions don't happen in a moment. It's not like somebody phoned into the White House switchboard and said, hey, by the way, we've got him in our sights. You want us to take him out? Yeah, take him. <laughs> um, these things involve uh, lots of planning, lots of options, lots of intel, much of which turns out to be bad or inaccurate or not useful uh, or practical or executable. And so there's a, there's a long string, not only of events that lead up to these things, uh, but of sources and methods and people who are involved in this kind of planning. And then when the moment finally comes, that's when the president has to step in and make that call. And several presidents uh, of his predecessors have had an opportunity to make calls like that, and, and most did not. Uh, they chose to not take the shot at the terrorist leader. And so Number one, it's not just President Trump we're talking about. There's a whole group of people that's involved in a decision like this and in laying the groundwork for it and in letting the president know whether this is a possibility, okay? So it's not just some rogue guy there that's making that decision. Uh, number two, we're not just dealing with, uh, we're not dealing with, first of all, with an elected official from another country. It's not a, an assassination of a government official. We're dealing with a guy who is acknowledged by the world <laughs> to be the leader of the state sponsor of terrorism. So Iran has been branded by many, many countries as a state sponsor of terrorism, including the United States. And this guy was the leader of the Quds Force, which is the worst of the worst. And so this is a, a bin Laden type character and that he just has the imprimatur of government because he happens to be part of this uh, you know, Islamic regime um, that has given him credibility. He is wearing the uniform of Iran 
Khan, but he is a terror leader. And so, uh, you know, I'd ask you to consider the possibility of what would you do if you knew that you had in your sights a terrorist who had been taking out a lot of Americans and a lot of other people. Would you take the shot? Would you not take the shot? Uh, the other thing is we have a tendency to look at the people of Iran as, you know, when people say the United States, uh, they think of the government of the United States, but they also think the people of the United States. And in general, the people and the government, despite our differences, are not that far apart uh, in, in our overall objectives. But when you say Iran, there's a distinct difference between the yes. governing body and, the, and the, the mullahs that lead Iran and the vast populace, the people of Iran. And what it's hard to understand if if you live in a free country is what it's like to live in a non-free country, is what it's like to be uh, trying to make it day to day in a country where if your enthusiasm for the actions of the government somehow seem inadequate, then you are immediately suspect and that your property and those you love could be at risk. And so when you see, for example, crowds of thousands of people uh, in the streets so-called mourning the death of this great leader of Iran, uh, what you need to realize is not mourning the death of Soleimani is a prosecutable offense. It is. It puts you in in question and at risk. It puts your family at risk. It puts your business, your property, uh, everything at risk. And so you must go to the streets. You must mourn Soleimani. Don't be uh, don't be deceived by the apparent uh, outflowing of grief over this guy. Um, these people who live in Iran are not supporters of the government. They are hostages of the government. They are captives of the government. And they will continue to behave as if they were supporters of the government until they see an opportunity to break free of their captors. Um, you know, the, the idea somehow that we look at that and we tend to project ourselves. We say, well, well, there were 100,000 Americans in the street. That would be a serious thing. And we should pay attention to that. There cannot not be 100,000 people in the streets of Tehran or in the hometown of Soleimani where he was buried. Where God bless their souls, 50 people last count were trampled to God death Lord. in this fake funeral that was staged for this supposed revered figure. I talked to a customer in the store where I work in my other full-time job, and um, they said the day before this uh, missile strike, they found out, uh, This w a woman was telling me this and her husband sitting right there, that her husband's parents uh, plea to be to be able to escape Iran and come to the United States had been rejected. The the government of Iran had not allowed them to travel out of there. Um, this this is the kind of regime that we have. This is the kind of country that needs to find ways to keep its people in uh, because people want to get out. So in any case, all of that said, um, the final thing I would say: you take out a guy like this and every other guy like this in the world, not that there was anybody at his level, but every other terrorist leader in the world is taking a second glance over his shoulder and wondering if that humming noise he just heard was a drone at 30,000 feet and wondering if he is gonna get a chance to take his final breath before the explosion. And that, whatever you think of it, and the evils of, of killing um, is better than the alternative of letting that guy go on to breathe the free air and carry out his evil deeds. So I hope you're able to just kind of open up your mind a little bit to the possibility that there may be things that you're not hearing in the mainstream media. There may be points of view that you haven't fully considered. And I'm not even asking you to, to endorse or like Donald Trump. I'm just asking you to open up the possibility that let's say a different president of the United States might have made a similar decision because it's a rational and reasonable thing to do. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making this possible.